Hey guys, thanks so much for coming out. It, the first step is to put your headphones on. And then once you put your headphones on, you'll be able to hear our presentation, which is gonna be fantastic today. I'm really excited to introduce you guys to Ken Croak. He's actually the president as well as the founder of InsideSales.com. And what's so fantastic about InsideSales.com is that even at Aptis, we're using this product for our BDR organization as well as part of our sales organization. So this tool really helps maximize your sales department, which is exactly what Accelerate is all about. It's about teaching you how you can use Aptis' product to accelerate your teams. So I'm really excited to have Ken here, and I think you guys are really going to love to hear what he has to say. Thanks so much for joining us today, Thank Ken. Thank you, Kat. Appreciate it. Excited to be here, everybody. Uh, first time I've uh, had a headset where I could hear myself speak while I was speaking. This is great. It's probably messing up my hair, but I think that's going to be okay. Um, this is one of my first times back speaking. I was in a pretty bad uh, truck accident about a year and a half ago. And um, during that time, I had to deal with some pretty serious concussion. And it's been a bit of a makeover for me. So uh, what I'm about to talk about, which is the science of sales transformation, I, I, I think is going to be applicable for me and hopefully for all of you. Now, Who's had to deal with uh, an executive who uh, doesn't quite give you all the time and focus that you need in your world? Who's one of those executives that doesn't quite give all the focus you need in your world? Okay, <laughs> no, hand, no one admits that, do they? All right, well, we're going to talk about rule number one, which is executive sponsors. I'm going I'm to walk you through five key rules of sales transformation. Now, I've been doing this a long time. I started the original inside sales department at Franklin Quest a long time ago. Anybody, any Franklin Day Planner users in the audience? Okay, there we go, all right. So that, that's where I first came from. And um, I want to tell you a story that happens to me quite a bit. Gabe Larson here is our director of uh, Inside Sales Labs, and he and I have gone out on the road a lot working with clients and customers. And as you may know, inside sales is is still a fairly new sales model uh, compared to the traditional outside sales model that's been used for 125 years. But inside sales really came about as a result of web conferencing combined with the telephone. It was telemarketing that came about as a result of the phone by itself. But when we were able to project our desktop remotely to anywhere in the world, that's when professional salespeople were able to get involved in the sales process. And then when the crash of 2008 happened, all of a sudden the cost to travel uh, made inside sales even more popular. And the research that was done in 2009 right after the crash showed that inside sales started growing 15 times faster than the traditional sales model. And by 2010, there were now more inside salespeople than outside salespeople. Most people don't know that. And now there's a, a hybrid model developing where we used to go face to face if we were outside four and a half times. Now we go one to two times. And the rest of the time is spent uh, using inside sales, which is really remote sales. Well, what's happened is a lot of the leadership that have come up through the ranks of outside sales are now trying to figure out how do we do this new model? And that's where this has really come about. As we've sat down with our thousands of clients, one of the first things they ask us is, you know, we, we need to know, you know, even what the inside sales model is. Now there's two basic approaches to inside sales. You'll probably be aware of them. The first is called the high velocity model. And we had a hand at inside sales in actually inventing that model. It's all about making more calls faster. The second model is for the enterprise and that's account based sales. And that's a really big uh, item right now. Who's involved in, in more of the small mid-sized business realm? Okay, how about the enterprise, larger? Okay. So we'll spend a little bit of time on both, but what we've learned is that either one, it's pretty critical, you learn how to do change management. Now again, I'm, I'm one of the two founders of Inside Sales, been doing this a long time, and uh, that was me 10 or 15 pounds ago. <laughs> you know, after my car accident, I caught chest to drawers disease. Have you heard about that? It's where your chest falls to your drawers. <laughs> Some of you have seemed to have, you catch it at the dinner table. Uh, it's contagious. Some of you are doing pretty good though. You stay away from it. That's great. Well, I'm still working on it. I'm down 20 pounds, but I got a long way to go. That, that was a side benefit of not having a lot to do for a year and a half while, you're, while I'm healing. 
But let's talk about the agenda today. We're going to focus on five key rules of sales transformation. Number one is executive sponsorship. That's leadership. Number two is governance. That's management. Number three is full engagement. That's your front lines, okay? Then we focus on metrics and on process. We're going to show you some really fun rules that will help you manage the change in your organization. Okay, we're going to walk you through that. Change takes all kinds of names. In education, change is called learning. In religion, change is called repentance. In business, it's called change management. If you want to charge a lot of money, you just call it sales transformation. You can triple what you charge for it. So we opted for the sales transformation uh, title. Here we go. We're going to jump in. Now, while I was away for 18 months, I had a lot of time to think. And I found one of my biggest problems. I, I used to write for Forbes magazine about every two weeks. I'd put an article out. I had some of the top articles in the world for Forbes for a while there. And then after a, a double brain injury, I tried to write in an article for Forbes and they yanked it down in four hours and I knew I was in trouble. I, so I had some problems. My Forbes article actually, an uh, editor flew out and helped me learn to write again. And what I had to do was actually dictate my thoughts, have it transcribed, and then I could start editing and that actually helped pull me out of it. It was pretty crazy. Well, for 18 months, I wrote three books. <laughs> the first one was really bad, so I rewrote it. I, I'm on my fifth rewrite. So be kind to me when it finally comes out, okay? Say, say nice things about me. But while I was away, we realized, I realized that there was a core to inside sales that I had forgotten, our company. And that is, what we did is we used to test everything. We were known for research. We put out a research study with MIT about how fast you need to respond to leads that went viral. And there's now 650,000 companies that have downloaded that research. Well, when I was aware of this, man, we got to get back to that. So we formed a new division. This is a brand new research study that just came out. It, it's absolutely incredible. And, and, and what we did is we analyzed 9.2 million data points in our HD forecast platform. And we asked the question, is it really a good or a bad thing to close all your sales at the end of the month? How many of you guys in your businesses, the salespeople wait to the last day to close everything, right? Well, guess what? There's a really, really big problem. There's actually two big problems with doing that. Look at that dramatic fall off in deal size the last three days of the month. Guys, this is 9.2 million data points. It drops a significant amount of revenue by pushing it those last three days. But right before, it, it peaks out. The other big problem is you drop by close ratios by almost half. Almost half. Now here's another stat that's really amazing. What we found is by pushing, by salespeople waiting the last of the month and pushing for the close, they did raise closes by about two and a half times. But they raised lost sales by 11 and a half times. Oh my gosh. So we got a bit of a win, but we burned about four times more sales than we won. So that study I'm going to share with you right at the end, but I wanted you to be aware the power of research to change and transform our business. Now we're going to get into the five steps. Again, so Inside Sales Labs is our new division, and uh, we're really excited. We, we try to do one new research study every month. We've got five of them out since we came out five months ago, so we're on track. And I'm going to show you the first, well, actually the second time we've shared this data. This isn't even out in the study yet, but this is research based on the top challenges that sales executives have. So there's some really cool data points here, and we're going to use it to illustrate our five steps of sales transformation. So here we go. Number one, when I get started, when Gabe and I go out on the road, I've done probably 70 of these engagements with organizations. There's three kinds of transformations that people ask us to do. The first is called a startup. Now that one's really easy because we're starting from scratch and there's no bad habits to unlearn, right? The second one is an accelerate. That's an, an organization that's doing pretty good but the third one is 55% of all the engagements we, we uh, engage with is a turnaround. And that's really, really hard to do because we're already going in one direction and, and usually it's downhill a little bit and our job is to help them get back and get rolling again. That's hard to do. And the only way we've done it is been able to teach these five lessons. So this is really important. If you need to turn things around in your organization, please take note here because by the way, we, I build 20 grand a day when I go out and do this, and I don't have time to get around to it, so I finally wrote this crazy book, The Science of Sales Transformation, and hopefully it will help you. 
So let's jump in. Here they are, the five basic steps of sales transformation and the number one most important is executive sponsorship. If you don't have the person with power, the person with authority involved in the process over time, you're gonna be in trouble. Okay, we're gonna go step by step through each one of these. Again, governance is management, full engagement is getting the front lines involved and engaged. I was talking with Kat earlier, we were preparing, uh, comparing notes, see? Brain trauma, brain trauma. It's so nice to have a brain trauma because you can blame anything you want on it. <laughs> then you gotta measure the metrics and then change your process. We're gonna show you how to do it. Number one, executive transformation. Now, ProSci did a research study in 2016 and they, they surveyed thousands of companies who were involved in a change management process. And they asked the, the executives, they said, we're gonna ask you a really dumb question. Do you even know what your roles are? Do you know what you're supposed to be doing? And 58% admitted that they don't. So we figured that's a pretty good place to start. Now, I'm gonna roll in a little bit. Like I said, I, I've been doing this a long time. And in my own challenges with, with, with this recovery, you know, I, I found that it was really hard for me to engage in something over time. And that's the same challenge that leaders do. They get so busy, but as soon as they disengage, things start to decay. So here's the three jobs of a change manager executive, okay? Number one, your job is to build a coalition with the stakeholders. And we're gonna show you some research about what that means. Who are the people that should be sitting at that round table supporting your department, your division, or your company? Your job is to build that coalition. Number two, you then need to communicate and promote what is decided out to the people. You're the cheerleader, you're the megaphone, you're the one with the power to make sure the water gets to the end of the rope. And lastly, you need to be visible in your participa participation throughout the change management process. Now that's not really hard to do, but you gotta be consistent. So those are the big three. They are by far the most important. The executive sponsor is the key to real change. Now here's the problem. What usually happens when we come into an organization and, and we get our uh, technology involved, the leader signs off and says, well, I'm done. And we never see them again. And neither do their team because they think, well, they got it. But the problem is it's the leader who has the power to pull all the resources together and overcome the obstacles. Those are the two main things the leader has to do. Provide resources, remove obstacles, okay? And if you delegate that to someone without the same power, it immediately starts to decay and we're all in trouble. So that's, that's a big warning right there. If you delegate your authority, now you don't have to stay involved every day, but at least once a month. And we're gonna show you how that works. The next is called governance. Governance, now that's another fancy name. What it really means is project management and following through operationally but there's about four key steps to governance. This is the management stage, stage number two. Now, we told you a few minutes ago that the job of the leader is to make sure that all the stakeholders are sitting at that round table and they stay involved. So that study that we mentioned, the top challenges of executives, we asked three things. We said, who are the stakeholders that you need that are most helpful? Who are the, executive, are the stakeholders that are least helpful? And what's the gap between those? So interestingly enough, for the sales division, the most helpful and the most needed division was marketing. Now the American military, I went to the United States Naval Academy. My, my goal was to fly the space shuttle. And our job, along with the Air Force, was to provide air cover for the ground troops. And that's sort of what marketing is. Marketing is the air cover that softens up the targets, that brings in the leads, that changes the brand and the awareness. And if, and if that partnership at the round table isn't happening, that's your single most important department for sales. All right? Now, this next one's really interesting. This is the group that is most needed, but usually isn't as helpful, but it's not their fault. It's usually your fault because you don't communicate well. That's the HR department. This had the biggest gap between need and help. But as we surveyed, it wasn't their fault, it was the sales team's fault because they got too busy. 
and, re and recruiting and hiring is in the top three issues for the sales division. So leaders, go get a closer relationship with your HR department and you'll be able to bring more resources to bear for your teams. This was a big area of upside opportunity. Third, <laughs> least helpful. I would bet it would be accounting, right? From sales, but no, it's legal. Now, they're trying, but usually their job is risk avoidance, correct? So when we delved a little deeper, we found that it's not that the legal teams were, you know, angry or frustrated or upset or trying to slow things down. It's that they had to provide risk management and salespeople, you know, salespeople, right? You know, they just want to close some deals and move on. So you've got to build really strong relationships right here with the legal teams if you're going to do your job as a executive in the sales division. Now, this is one of my favorite. This is once we've got governance in place, let me tell you how it works a little bit. Step number one in governance is you have to form what's called a steering committee. A steering committee is where the leader gets involved once a month with the stakeholders in charge of the different divisions, okay? Once a month. The second step is operationally, you get the project managers of each uh, division once a week, okay? So leaders once a month, managers once a week, but then this skill comes in. This is one of my favorites. This is a, a, a shot of one of the coolest fighter planes on the planet, and this book is Flawless Execution by James D. Murphy, a former fighter pilot for the U.S. military. Now the U.S. military, we sell our planes all over the world, but in terms of competence and flight ratios, the American military are the best, but it's the same equipment. So what's different? Well, let me tell you what, what he teaches in this amazing book called Flawless Execution. It's, it's an amazing model called the debrief. Now there's a mission room uh, on every flight deck, whether you're on an aircraft carrier or back at the Air Force Base, and, people, and the leaders who are about to do the, the mission, they come in and the American military has patches. They have a name patch and a rank patch. When they walk into that room, there's a table right inside the door. They rip off their patch and slam it down, rip off their uh, rank and slam it down. And symbolically what that means is there are no generals, there are no sergeants in this room. We're about to speak truth and we have to be able to be blunt with radical candor and just tell people what's going on, what's about to happen, because we got a $100 million plane and lives at stake here. And, and their motto is truth, not harmony. They want you to speak out, and they say it's not about who's right, it's about what is right. Now that's hard to do. The world of politics makes that really challenging. So the first time you get together in what's called a brief debrief model, you have to get everybody to agree to those conditions. And it's in that special room where you do the brief debrief between all your supporting divisions. And then when marketing does their job and generates all these great leads, they come into sales once a week and they say, how do we do? And how can we improve? And they got to be willing to just listen. And then in, in turn, sales has got to turn to marketing and say, how do we do? And how can we improve? And then what you do is you take notes in what we call a rolling agenda. And those notes become the brief before the next week. You see how that works? So you brief at the first of the week, you debrief at the end of the week, and every single meeting gets a little bit better at what you do, you guys. When, when World War II happened and uh, the Americans and the Japanese were fighting, that was one of the things the American decided to try and help do is send over Edward Deming to the Japanese people to help in their rebuild. And he basically taught this quality loop concept. And the Japanese got so good at it, they're the best in the world at what they meant. So there must be someone from the Japanese messing with my headset back there, because I must be saying something wrong, right? <laughs> anyway, there we go. You guys, can you hear me okay? Mine's sort of weird, but anyway. But the Japanese really learned this incredible ability of quality control, of iteration, of getting better day after day after day after day. And pretty soon, Toyota and Honda and Nissan became the best automakers in the world. And then Korea figured it out. And they came on strong, and they did something a little bit different. Hyundai put a 100,000-mile warranty in place. Remember that, when that first came out? And you know what? They admitted they weren't quite ready when they did it. But what would, what would happen to you if you put a 100,000-mile warranty out and you weren't ready? You dang well better get ready. 
So that's what they did. They learned that quality control model and pretty soon Hyundai and then Kia moved ahead of the Japanese for the first time in a decade. Now that's the model we're talking about in any organization and it's all about the same. There's only one basic process, quality, quality loops. Brief, debrief, always iterating, always getting better. So this is the core of quality control and quality improvement and you can do it in sales, you can do it in accounting, you can do it quote to cash. It's all about improvement and getting better day after day. That book is amazing. Number three, full engagement. Full engagement. Now remember, we're, we're at the front lines. How do we get the front lines actually engaged? Kat, we were talking about that. Weren't, that's the big question. Well, here's, here's some ideas about how to do it. Number one, go out to Google. There was a research study done by Gallup. Gabe was there for several years. Gallup's probably the biggest pols pollster company or in the world. And they surveyed 17 million employees, and they, and they, and they found that only 32% of them were actually engaged in the workplace. And after these 17 million surveys, they followed the questions, and they said, what are the main problems with engagement? And they found 12 key questions. So go to Google and type in the 12 engagement questions of Gallup, and that will completely change your organization. They will even come in and do it. We've, we've had them do it with us. It's been remarkable. There's some amazing little th things like, do they have a mentor? Does their manager care about them? Do they have a best friend at work? I won't give them all away. I'll, I won't rob you of the journey. But I'm going to go to the second area of full engagement. And we surveyed these same executives and we asked, what are your top challenges? Well, guess what? Culture was number one for almost a fourth of them. Culture. So how do you deal with culture, you guys? That's a huge question. Well. This is one of my friends. I've gotten to know Clayton Christensen. He's been ranked the top management consultant in the world. He's a Harvard business professor. In 2011, he was ranked number one management consultant in the world. And he wrote a book that changed my life. And in that book, he tells a story about his own transformation. He wasn't always the, the best professor. In fact, he was doing pretty good for a while. And then he started noticing that his students weren't engaged and they started sloughing class. They started marking him low on his grade, grade because they grade the professors at Harvard. And it was really getting to be troublesome. He had his, client, his colleagues come in and say, sit in my class and see what's wrong. What am I doing wrong? Because my students don't seem to even enjoy my class. They're not engaged. They're marking me really low. And his colleagues came in and said, we can't see any problem. You seem to be doing fine. Well, one day he was on a plane flying to Minneapolis, and seated next to him was an elder of the Lakota Indian tribe. This is in his book. It's amazing. And the, the elder turns to him and said, what do you do? He says, well, I, I teach at Harvard. He paused for a minute. He said, is teaching at Harvard fun? And he thought for a minute, he's never been asked if it's fun to teach at Harvard. And he said, you know, it used to be, but right now I'm having some real challenges. And and the elder said, well, tell me about the challenges that you're having. And he went on and on about all the things I just mentioned. And the elders paused for a few minutes. And he said, they don't know you love them. Your students need to know you love them. And he went back and he thought, oh, my heavens, I've never been told to improve my Harvard class with love. <laughs> but the next time... Before he started his class, he shut the door of his little office there and he sat down and he meditated, he had a prayer and he said, help me love them. Help me love what I do. Can you see I love what I do? I love what I do. Do you love what you do? Do you love your product? Do you love your people? Any one of them will work. And that's what he figured out. And all of a sudden, from then on, he made that a practice before every class. He would stop and pause and make sure his motives were pure and that his goal was for them, not for him. And all of a sudden, his rankings became the highest at Harvard, and they've never turned around. And so he says there are four levels of culture. And you, the leader, are the one who decides what that culture is going to be. The first level is love. And love is the greatest of all. The next is duty. The next is fear. Then there's hate. All four of them are effective. Hitler taught us that. They all get things done. The question is, what culture are you going to drive? Now the nice thing about love is the more you give it away, the more it increases. And for me, you can't always stay in the realm of love, but at least be in love and duty if you can. And like I said, they all work and you'll have, they all have side effects. 
So you just have to decide. Now, the good thing about love is all the side effects seem to be really good. All right. So anyway, our research shows this is very, very relevant. The top management consultant in the world, the one who wrote Innovator's Dilemma, who coined the phrase a disruptive company, that's him, decided this was absolutely critical to the heart and soul of culture. Okay, so I hope that helps. I speak all over the last 15 years. This is the thing managers come up to me later and says, Ken, when you spoke two years ago, that right there had the most impact on me. So I brought it back. It's an intangible, but it's critical. All right, the next is metrics, you guys. Executives, 18.5% said metrics were their top challenge. So let's jump into what do you do about metrics? Well, this one's really easy. And I'm just going to tell you a quick story about this man, Bill Phillips. This was the largest weight loss. Can you see I'm on like a weight loss kick right now? <laughs> Bill, hundreds of thousands of people took this weight loss challenge. It was called Body for Life. And what they would do is they would take a picture of you holding up a US Today, USA Today on the day you started. And then 12 weeks later, you had to do it again and show your transformation. So here's the basic rule. It's really simple. Do the same thing. Take a baseline or a snapshot of where you're at right now. And then do a weigh-in once a month. But what we always do is we just look at, what have I done this month? Always compare it to that first baseline, you guys. Then you can see the value and the lift and the change that you've made. And things get really good at that point. But if all you worry about is next month and never look back where you've come from, it's really hard to improve. But that's transformation right there. So have your baseline, then do the weigh-ins and see how far you've come. All right, number five. Here we go. Process. Now, this is where you have to roll up your sleeves and do a little bit of work, okay? And I've got a minute and a half left, so I'm going to go fast here. Gabe here is our expert on process. And what we do, the first thing we do is we come in and we map our process on a single piece of paper. Most companies have not even done that, okay? In fact... What we found is about 70% of companies do not, have not mapped a dynamic process at all. So in this same research study, we checked the top 20 issues with sales executives. The biggest issue by fall was lead quantity and quality. That was over half of them said that's our top issue. Two was pipeline, three was prospecting. All the green are process related. The blue are people related. Recruiting, hiring, performance management. Now, we have all 20 of these coming out in this study. I'm going to stand over here at the end with my business card. If you would like to get this study and the first one, let me know. I'll make sure you get them. But process is absolutely critical. And what we recommend you do, just like the manufacturing uh, division and industry figured out how to map process, 70% of companies don't do it. But what we do is we sit down on a whiteboard. And, and this is Gabe doing a process map. And when we're done... It ends up like this. You can find out how to do it on the web. We'd be happy to help you if you need it. But start with just mapping out the current state of what you do. Okay? This is your baseline. Then you go to a future state of what you're going to do. And you see the green boxes? Those are going to be levers that you pull to improve. I'm at six seconds. I'm talking fast. All right, here we go. So guess what? I'm on my last slide. <laughs> This is the study that we'll have for you, the one that I promised of the top challenges that's not out yet, but if you'll give me your card, I'll make sure you get it. It's the first study of its kind about top sales execs. But again, those are the five steps of sales transformation. How did I do? <laughs> and that's with a brain injury, you guys. That's with a brain injury. <laughs> Thanks so much.